Okay, so this is a asynchronous supporting video for chapter two, and we're going to cover uh, pressure and some of the concepts and uh, equations that we're going to use in this section. So first, as a recap, pressure is a thermodynamic quantity. Um, rather than being a force, it is often confused with. Remember that pressure is a force divided by an area. So it's only when the pressure is times by the area or, or, or by the surface on which it's acting that it becomes a force. Um, for that reason, it doesn't have um, a direction because it's not a vector. It's a point quantity, as we're going to show later on in these slides. It has uh, units, a range of different units. We'll often use SI units, uh, units per meter squared, pascals, but we'll also interchange between various other ones that are commonly used in engineering, like bar and atmosphere and pounds per square inch. You don't need to remember the conversion factors, but you'll probably start to become familiar with them. So it helps to understand, uh, to, to, to visualize what fluid, what pressure actually is at a microscopic level uh, in a fluid, and down to the individual molecules that are bombarding on a surface, you can start to see that pressure is a, des a description of, of the particle's uh, speed, velocity, um, and their density. Um, but more importantly, their frequency of, of collision with, uh, with a solid object, whether that's a wall or um, a body that's immersed in the fluid. And so it's really key to point out that the force only arises when the surface is um, impacted by the fluid. Remember that pressure is the, the force divided by the area, the force is the area times the pressure. Without the surface, there isn't a force. And then we can review this diagram that came up in week one, uh, comparing some of the ideas between uh, a solid and a liquid. And um, we can see that in this, in general, the solid uh, at rest will, um, will stay in its roughly its equilibrium shape. Here it's subject to uh, a compression due to gravity, a force acting on it, which sags it down. And that's, that static deflection is exaggerated by the dashed lines. But you can see that there isn't a side force acting on it. There isn't a, a force that's needed to hold it up. The only force is this compression due to its own weight. Um, and then if you slice this solid in an arbitrary angle, this is where you get an interchange between a normal stress and a, and a shear stress, depending on how your, your slice is aligned to the direction of the force, in this case, gravity. When that slice is kind of obliquely um, you know, not orthogonal or not horizontal to that to, to the direction of gravity, then you're going to get a shear stress as well. And the shear stress is non-zero and it can stay non-zero at rest, which is characteristic of a solid. And the most circle, which you will um, learn a lot more about in solid mechanics structural structure um, module that you'll have in this semester or next semester, will uh, it, it's a convenient way to see how the um, the shear stress and the normal stress vary with, with the angle theta, according to how, where you cut your, your body. Suffice to say that in a solid, you have this kind of constant exchange according to your angle between shear stress and normal stress, but for a fluid, you don't. For a fluid, you have um, the walls of the container, which, which have to kind of hold the fluid together. And when the fluid is at rest, you have this P, which is, the, which is the pressure due to the sides of this container. Um, and, and it becomes, uh, in the vertical sense, it's also due to its weight. Um, but if, um, if the fluid is at rest, then there is no shear stress. And this can be seen by taking an arbitrary cut through the fluid element. And you can see that there's only always a normal component to the surface that you cut. And this is the definition of a fluid. Um, on the Mohs circle, the corresponding diagram shows that your point, your pressure at that point is always going to be on the normal stress axis, not on the shear stress. Um, and so this is the main differential between a solid and a fluid. Okay, so now to compute, um, to derive some of the expressions that we're going to need to use in hydrostatics, we're going to consider a small element of fluid in um, in a larger body of fluid at rest. So this fluid is this, this element is a wedge-shaped element, has size delta x, 
delta Z, delta S, where delta, the triangle symbol, means a small but finite uh, quantity. So it means not infinitely small, uh, which uh, D does. So it's small but finite, which in this body of stationary fluid, which also extends into the page by a dimension B, width B into the paper. This um, wedge has a volume of, of uh, equal to the area, cross-sectional area, so a triangle, half base times height, half base times height, times by the, the distance into the page B. And so the, the volume times the density times the gravity gives you the weight. So this element has this weight. Okay, so the fluid um, in this element is considered to be at rest. So as we saw in the previous slide, there's no shear. And in this case, then the pressure variation is due only to the weight. It's the only force which is acting on this fluid, the weight. There's no other force. And so in order to analyze this system, we're going to construct a free body diagram. So we're going to use uh, this small element and then apply Newton's second law, F is equal to MA. And because it's at rest, we know that MA is equal to zero. There's no acceleration, it's not moving, so there's no uh, force. The resultant of this the resultant force on this system is zero. We're also going to make the assumption that the element is small enough so that the variation of pressures along each of these surfaces is constant, which is a reasonable assumption to make when it's a small element. Okay, so pressure um, acting on this uh, element of fluid, we're going to sum first the forces in the x direction. So all of the components here, we're going to have a component of force on this face from Px. We're going to have a component of Pn acting on this face, although we're going to have to decompose this into the vertical and the horizontal. So the sum of the forces in the x direction is equal to zero because it's not moving, it's not accelerating. And then it's equal to the pressure times the area. So Px times this area, so delta Z times B in the span direction, minus Pn sine theta, Pn sine theta is going to be this, times by B in the span direction, and um, times by the area delta S. So in order to simplify this, we're going to introduce these geometric relations, and this surface here, delta S, is equal to, uh, sorry, we're going to substitute in delta Z here, Delta Z is equal to delta S sine of theta. Delta Z, this side is equal to delta S sine of theta, gives you this dimension. So you substitute that in, you have um, delta Z appearing twice. And in fact, you can cancel out B times delta Z from both of these terms, and then you're left with Px is equal to Pn. So there's no change in the pressure in the horizontal direction. It's an important first result. And then we're going to sum the forces in the vertical direction, Z. Again, following the same technique, the sum of the forces in the Z direction is zero because there's no motion, it's at rest. Uh, we're going to first consider the, the pressure PZ over the surface delta X times by B, so that area X times B. And we're going to take away the pressure PN because it's acting vertically downwards. This is going to be times by the area um, delta S times B, but it's only going to be the component Pn cos of theta, so only this amount. We also, in this case, have to account for the, um, for the weight. And this is going to be the, the term that we introduced on the last slide, so delta, so rho times G times half B delta X delta Z, which is introduced here, and it's, it's negative because it's going against the direction uh, Z. Again, we can simplify that by using the substitution S cos of X, cos of theta is equal to delta X. And we're then left with a, an expression that says the pressure in the vertical direction is equal to the, the normal pressure or the pressure N plus the uh, half times the density times gravity times the the delta Z, if you like, the vertical distance. And to prove that this is indeed a point quantity, 
we're going to consider what happens to these pressures, the pressures on each of these three faces, when we shrink the element from something which is finitely small to something infinitely small. So in that case, in the limit that um, we go to an infinitely small side, delta z, this term will vanish and we'll be left with pz is equal to pn. And we already know that pn is equal to px, so then we can say all three of those pressures are the same, and indeed it collapses to a point. So in the limit where the wedge shrinks to a point, pressure is constant because it's a point property. Okay, so we can go a step further and we can start to construct the, the flow equations to consider what would happen in the general case where you have a 3D pressure field and you have a number of forces acting on an element of the fluid. To do this, we're going to start with this time a cube element because we're going to do it in, in each of the three dimensions in the same way. Starting with x, and in, in a very similar way, we're going to sum the forces in the x direction. So this is the pressure acting on this face times by the area dz dy and again uh, we move to the other side and this time we've incremented the pressure proportional to the pressure gradient partial dp over partial dx times by the distance over which we've traveled dx which will give us a change in the pressure across this element so the, the new pressure on this space times by the area dz d, uh, um, dz dy will give us the, the force that's acting across this element in the x direction. And if you expand this term, you can see that you have a, a positive and a negative term, which cancel out, and you're left with partial dp, partial dx, times by dx dy dz, which is the volume of this cube. You can do exactly the same in the other two coordinate directions. And because we haven't introduced any body forces, uh, the format is identical, except in each case you substitute um, the subscript. So this would be so dy, dp dy, dz, dp dz. And you're left with then um, something which starts to look like a vector. And you have uh, a bold font for vector. The, the change in the force over this element depends on the coordinate direction you're in times by the corresponding pressure gradient term. And this really underlines it. So you, you then divide through by your volume. So you have a force per unit volume, a force per unit volume is equal to the pressure gradient term itself. And this is something that comes up again and again in fluid mechanics. The gradient operator or grad or sometimes nabla is a vector. It um, is the d by dx in each of the coordinate directions. And here it's applied, when, when multiplied by to a scalar, you get a vector. So remember, the pressure itself is a scalar quantity, but the, uh, the pressure gradient becomes a vector. Okay, so why is this important? Well, because we start to be able to construct the fluid mechanics equations. The sum of the forces acting on this fluid element um, can comprise a pressure gradient term, a gravity term, the viscous forces. And all of these forces um, can contribute to the left-hand side of Newton's second law, F is equal to ma, where we re rewrite the mass as a product of the density and the volume. Or per unit volume, it's small f is equal to rho a. And then the sum of these forces, so the, the pressure gradient force, the gravity, body force and the viscous force can be represented in, in this uh, format, gradient of P times uh, the density times the gravity vector times by another term for the viscous force. And all the combination of all three of these terms is equal to the mass per unit volume or the density times by the acceleration. In the case that the fluid is at rest, this term is zero. In the case that the fluid is not at rest, this equation still applies. So this is a really powerful equation because it starts to represent a dynamic uh, flow field. And in, indeed, it forms the basis of the exact fluid mechanics equations, the Navier-Stokes equations, which you're going to come up against later on in this module, but also uh, again and again in, this, in your degree. Okay, 